Good evening and welcome to another presentation from the Agency for Public Information, the API. This program keeps you informed on the plans, projects and policies of the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I am Shana Daniel. Just ahead, a high-level delegation from India visits St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Foster parents here receive three days of training. Local small business owners learn how to access funding. We'll highlight the a new program that is changing lives through skills acquisition. And we'll end this edition with a look at our notice board for important notices and announcements. Stay with us. The details to this informative package will follow Newswatch. Good evening and thank you very much for joining us for News Watch for Tuesday, April 24th, 2018. I am Ashisi Assam. St. Vincent and the Grenadines is one step closer towards ratifying the Minimata Convention on Mercury. On Monday, April 23rd, 2018, a national inception workshop was held at the NIS training room for key stakeholders within the various sectors which are either directly or indirectly involved with the naturally occurring element. Project Supervisor and the Director of the Sustainable Development Unit within the Ministry of Finance, Janiel Miller Findlay, underscored the importance of ratifying the Minimata Convention, which is expected to enact significant responses to chemical management within the country. Today is an important step towards bringing mercury into focus as we move towards um, better chemical management in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This national launch and inception workshop for the MIA, which is the Minimata Initial Assessment Project, main objective is to have or to get participating countries towards early ratification and implementation of the Minimata Convention. The Minimata Convention on Mercury is a global treaty to protect human health and the environment from the adverse effects of mercury. The project is funded by the United Nations Environment and is expected to be implemented in four Caribbean countries. As the demand for technical and vocational training continues to grow, Vincentians wishing to offer training programs locally are asked to contact the National Qualification Department or the Sector Skills Development Agency in order to ensure that requisite standards are being met. Director of the Sector Skills Development Agency, Kenroy Kittles, said the programs must adhere to a competency-based education training and assessment protocol so that the certificates gained at the end of the programs meet the standards and can be recognized. No more are we just delivering programs because we need some money and people sign up and so on. You need to get on board. In, and, and check out what quality you must offer, what are the standards. And once these standards are met, in terms of your facility, in terms of your staffing, in terms of delivering the, the program, then it makes the, the job of the National Qualifications Department much easier. The Sector Skills Development Agency is the certification body for locally offered programs and falls under the National Qualifications Department. This year will be a record-breaking year for Calypso in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This is according to the president of the Calypso Association, Earl Cabo Bennett. The president drew reference to the increase in the number of shows for Calypso this year. Based on the schedule of attendance, we are looking at over 25 shows in just Kaiso only. Calypso, Kaiso will start on April 27th with the upstage experience launching a cast at the Calico Hard Court. Graduates will have three shows all at the Russell's Auditorium. They begin on the 29th of May and they end on the 12th of June. Dynamites will kick off the preliminaries on the 9th of June at the Cafe Omar. 
after dynamites, we have on the 12th, we have graduates on the 13th, upstage, and on the 14th, the onto Calypso tent. The onto Calypso tent will be touring and will be in communities such as Leyu, Kaliakwa, and Sandy Bay. The president also disclosed that the queen of the Calypso competition will return to the calendar of activities for Vinci Mass and will take place at the Russell's Auditorium on June 8th. In more Calypso news, Mr. Bennett noted that the Calypso Association is exploring the possibility of reintroducing the extempo competition. Placing emphasis on the future of Calypso, the Calypso Association president revealed new initiatives that will aid in the further developing young Calypsonians. For the first time this year, we're going to have a junior Calypso caravan. And that caravan is extremely important because for the first time, we're going to be having the junior finalists performing before crowds before the finals on the 3rd of July. They will journey on the 12th of May to Leyu. On the 26th, they will journey to Sandy Bay, which is somewhat of a mecca for Calypso when it comes to Junior Calypso. And on the 9th, they will be, have the finale at the Annisville or the Iti Joshua Tarmac. A symposium was held earlier today for budding Calypsonians at the Peace Memorial Hall. Here's where we end News Watch for this evening. Do stay with us for the rest of our programming. I'm Shisia Sam. Good evening. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Thank you for staying with us. If you're just joining us, welcome. This is the presentation from the API. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is strengthening its cultural and diplomatic relations with the government of India. On Monday, April 23rd, a high-level delegation made a visit to this country. This report is by Nadia Slater. The delegation was made up of Minister of State of Law and Justice, His Excellency Shui Shaojui, and His Excellency Satenda Kumar, Ambassador of the Republic of India to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Their visit began with a tour to the traditional East Indian communities of Kaula and Richland Park, where they were welcomed by children of the Kaula Primary School and residents. The delegation visited the Summerway factory, not too far away. President of the Indian Heritage Foundation, Junior Bacchus, was on hand to welcome the delegation and noted that the foundation felt honored by the visit. We know that imp we, the improved relation is going to bring be benefits to us. We have been in discussion about scholarships. We have been in discussion about the, the PIO arrangement, people of Indian origin, to, to get access to citizenship in India. So there's... The people are welcoming him and he's very happy to be here and they are enjoying the trip. Speaking at the event was leader of the opposition, Dr. Godwin Friday, who expressed his pleasure at the tightening of bonds between the two nations, from which St. Vincent and the Grenadines stands to benefit immensely. That you can claim your Indian heritage proudly, while being distinctly and profoundly Vincentian. 
As Vincentians together, your Indian heritage is my heritage. We are a very young nation working out amongst ourselves who we are as Vincentians and what we represent as our identity to the rest of the world. It would be a great loss not to have the Indian people and culture form an acknowledged and visible part of our present reality. It is now that we are shaping ourselves in our youth as a nation, so to speak, that it is important that all the ingredients of our making are added to the mix so that over time they may, in the process of articulation, I say articulation rather than blending, of cultures, we create a beautiful, tolerant, diverse country. That is my wish. It is my hope, and for the Indian Heritage Foundation, it is your duty. As our guests, our friends, um, Minister Chowdhury, Ambassador Kumar, I hope that the ties that we form here will transcend cultural matters and become all-embracing. I hope that mutual economic benefits will also flow from our closer ties. You know better than me what you can do or what you can offer us. Skills and technology transfer, capital in the form of private investment, state-to-state -state assistance of all kinds are here of scholarships. I trust this is all part of the ties that bind us and that they will become stronger over time. His Excellency Satendra Kumar said he felt honored being in this part of the world. And now we had this opportunity to consolidate our relations further by having the presence of our Honorable Minister here and he brings you the message of our leadership in India. He brings you the message of the people of India. He brings you the friendship, excellency of, if not the largest population, but the second largest population of the world. And we believe in doing and praying as well. So we, on, on behalf of the people of India, I pray for the success in every venture for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I thank you, Indian Diaspora Association, for organizing this beautiful function with Indian food, culture, and the friendship. Thank you very much. Minister of State of Law and Justice, His Excellency Shui Chaudhry, brought greetings on behalf of his government to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Not only the people from Indian origin, but people from also NRI, the doctors, the academicians, they are here in this country and their contribution is also great. I'm also happy to know that the relationship between two countries we are having the traditional relation and strong ties and bondage and His Excellency, the Prime Minister of uh, S SVG and the Prime Minister of India, Honorable Narendra Modi, he also wants and he also conveyed the best wishes for the SVG and the people and the Prime Minister and everybody. And apart from this, as I have discussed with His Excellency Prime Minister about the, how we can extend the scholarship and the training in various sectors, including skill development and other disciplines. So it can be provided in India also to the students. His Excellency was very keen to see how we can extend. And apart from this, in fact, we are indebted. The contribution and the support which has been made to us at International Forum uh, in various elections, it may be a, in case of uh, 
uh, for appointment for nomination of the International Court of Justice in case of Dr. Dalvir Bhandari. So support which I have received, a support from a friend. Prime Minister Dr. Rav Gonzalez used the opportunity to highlight the history of East Indians in this country and how they became blended into the melting pot that is Vincentian culture and identity. You kept your culinary skills, Indian food, and inside, deep embedded in the Indian families, are the stories which pass down from generation to generation about passing the dark seas to come from India to come here. And that existential connection remained submerged but inside of the families. And you can see it whether you're in Rosebank, whether you're in Calder, <laughs> or Richland Park, Acres, Park Hill, Chester Cottage, but lower down in Bronxton, Yambu, that, well, the whole Argyle, Mount Pleasant, Calder area. And you saw it. That is, you see it in the families. And through the whole process of socialization, we have moved from this plural society to one where we have become a relatively homogeneous society, grounded on a set of values. Where we are, as I've said it before, a veritable symphony where we are the songs of the indigenous people, the Kalinago and the Garifuna. We are the rhythm of Africa. We are the melody of Europe. We are the chords of Asia. And we are the homegrown lyrics of the Caribbean. Dr. Gonzalez also noted that the growing power of India in the global economy, as well as their strides in the areas of technology, health, and industry, makes them an excellent ally for a small developing nation like St. Vincent and the Grenadines. His Excellency said that the number of persons who are involved in agriculture, but where India makes the money is in services. Immense ingenuity among the Indian people. And when St. Vincent and the Grenadines took the lead at the United Nations to have a day for creativity and innovation, it's the Indian permanent representative which provided us with the greatest support. And we have a resolution which has been accepted at the United Nations. And every day we set aside a day for creativity and innovation. You know, India, a lot of people pay attention to North Korea, as a nuclear power and pay attention that Israel is one but is not spoken about. Well, a country which is strong in nuclear energy is India. They are a serious power now and for the future. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines would be lacking in foresight if we do not hitch ourselves in a strategic way to strengthening and developing the relationship with India. It's a matter of our self-interest. viewing the presentation from the API. 
Foster care is a protective service to children when families can no longer care for them because of a range of issues which might include poverty, abuse, loss of job or mental illness. Foster parents have the unique opportunity to touch the lives of children in a significant way. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines recognizes the important role and continues to partner with foster parents here. The Child Protection Division in the Ministry of National Mobilization held a three-day training workshop to empower foster parents from April 18th to the 20th, 2018. Here is more in the following report. Twenty-seven foster parents here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines were exposed to three days of training geared towards helping them to better care for and understand the children they foster. At a closing ceremony held at the Girl Guides headquarters on Friday, April 20th, 2018, Director of the Child Care Protection Division, Gemma Alexander, underscored the important role that foster parents play in the life of a child. As foster parents, you have the responsibility to provide for the physical, emotional, and social needs of the children in your care, as you would for your own child. To help guide, to help, to help and guide them through the grieving and adjustment process that accompanies the removal from their families. This can be challenging at times, as it requires patience, commitment, and coping skills to deal with the many obstacles that may arise. I want to sincerely thank you for the courage to welcome a stranger into your home with little or no knowledge of who they are, and for being driven by the hope and faith that you can make a positive difference in their lives. Without you, the foster program would not be possible. I am truly grateful for each and every one of you who assists in caring for children who have been abused, abandoned, and neglected. Each child has a right to a safe childhood, and as foster parents, you are uniquely placed to make a positive impact because for many of these children, their tomorrow begins today with you. Remember, you might be temporary in their lives. They might be temporary in yours. But there's nothing temporary about the love or the lesson. Every child deserves to know the love of a family. Caring for children who have been neglected, abandoned, or abused is no easy task, as we hear in the testimonies of some of the foster parents who are involved in the training. Now, concerning my experience as a foster parent, this commenced over 10 years ago, when I came into contact with a needy, disadvantaged child who was three years old. The child's father was dead, and his mother seemingly had all but abandoned him to the friends who were providing her with a lodging. Unfortunately, these friends discriminated greatly against the advantage, the disadvantaged child. The plight of the child forced me to take him into my home immediately, even before consulting with my other family. Fortunately, none of them raised any objection to my hasty action. My son is sometimes <laughs> naughty and sometimes nice. But his be behavior has never gone overboard. Thank God. Two years ago, he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. 
and he is currently a regular attendee in our local church. He's active there. Now, with respect to my experience as a foster parent, this has been frustrating at times and delightful at times. I must give God, first of all, thanks and praise for making me the person who I am today. Loving, caring, that I, might, that I could share love with my foster child. As being a foster mother, it have hiccups, it have challenging, but no one is perfect. I always keep this in mind, to love the child, have patience with the child and communicate. And when those things come together, there's a resolution. I want to give thanks to the CP unit for giving me this opportunity to foster a child whom I've grown to love as if it's my own child. So I'm not really a foster mom, I'm a mom to this child. And I know she appreciates it. And thanks to my family because if they wasn't there to support me, sometimes I don't know where I wouldn't make it. So foster parenting is a joy for me and I wouldn't trade it for nothing in the world. Thank you. And I just want to thank God for welfare. Make my dream come true. You now my dream was that when I get, if I get rich, I will build this big house. I'll put girls at the upstairs and boys downstairs. Well, that did not happen with a lot. But from time to time, I always have somebody at my home. I can remember. 2005, I went to town, not have any idea that I was going to be a foster mom. I, my daughter was working at welfare and I went to visit her. I had my niece from America with me. And there was this lady there with this baby. She's not that she neglect the baby, nice, handsome little man. And Mr. Matthew was there at the time, and my daughter brought out the baby to me and said, Mommy, this lady brought the baby and said that she's giving it for adoption, and they need somebody to hold it for a while. And she put the baby in my hand. And when the baby, she, the baby was sleeping, and when he opened his eyes, oh my God, it was a beautiful smile. He looks at me, and he smiled, and he, said, he just melted my heart. And that day, I decided, I said, yes, I'm going to, I said, Avanel, I'm going to take the baby. I did not call my family. I did not um, ask my husband if I can take this baby, but my heart went out for the baby and I take that baby. That is 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I just want to give God thanks for him. There are lots of challenges, lots. There are times when I cry, but treat all. I learned to trust in Jesus. You know, 13 years ago, I've got a call from Mr. Matthews again. He said, Miss Young, we have a twin, and we do not have nobody. Nobody wants to take the two. Everybody wants to take one, but I, we do not want to separate twins. And I just said, bring them. Because, <laughs> you know, one of my dreams is that I want a twin, and I didn't I didn't give birth to a twin, but I was able to, to embrace the twin. And Miss John and Miss Jack brought the twin that evening. And, you know, I just embraced my boys. I just want to give God thanks and praise for them. There, there are many challenges. There are times when I go to the clinic and they have to give them vaccine. If they have to take blood from them, they are crying and I am crying. Sometimes the nurse have to put me out. And that is the soft spot that I have for these children. These children, they are not my flesh and blood, but I love them. And sometimes my children would say, Mommy, this I can love them the more than we. And clinical psychologist Dr. Jean De Silva commended the foster parents, noting that the task they perform in providing emotional support is critical to the success of foster children. As foster carers, you are all going to play a crucial role in the lives of children by providing a welcoming place in your home 
at a vulnerable time in their lives. As foster parents, you are there for some of the toughest moments in those children's lives, when they don't have their own parents or family to lean on for support. You bring joy and hope into their lives so that they will have good memories of what a loving, nurturing home should be. While it is no doubt scary and stressful for these vulnerable children to go into a stranger's home, I know that it's just as nerve-wracking to you as foster parents. Sometimes it's at three o'clock in the morning where something bad has happened and these poor children have nowhere else to turn. But no matter what time of day or night, foster parents they have to step in, step up, because they know a child is in trouble. Providing that consistency and stability to a child is a huge help to their emotional well-being and development, and can help to reduce the trauma from the volatile situation they were taken out from. So I want to sincerely thank you for being there to catch them when they need it the most. Thank you for your dedication, your compassion, and hard work. A caring and supportive family is so crucial to a child's success. The Minister with Responsibility for the Family, the Honorable Frederick Stevenson, also had high commendation for the foster parents as he thanked them for assisting the state to care for the needs of disadvantaged children. I want to, to congratulate you and to thank you for the work that you do. Continue to help us and help the state provide for, for many more of our children. We, we listen to the facts and we listen to the news recently, we have, because of the work of the ministry, our outreach and our awareness programs and so on, we've been having a lot more reported cases of, of child abuse and more importantly, child sexual abuse. Because there are many, many worthless men out there. And while I say that, there are also many worthless women too because there are some of them who put their children into these situations and these circumstances. And together, we have to try to help our nation's children to move them to a better way of life. And if we, we have to take away, because the state has a responsibility and the ministry has been given the mandate by the Child Care and Adoption Act, that we can go into homes and if we, if we know, and if we have the evidence, we can go into the homes and take away, take away the children and put them in a better place. Um, I want us to, to continue to, to work, as I'm talking now to the ministry officials, continue to do your outreach, um, continue to do your follow-ups, and to make sure that what we do as a ministry reflects the policy of the entire government. At the closing ceremony, the Child Care Protection Division recognized and awarded retired foster parent Mona Bramble for her outstanding contribution in fostering children between 2002 to 2017. Born on the 20th of November 1943, a good old long age that God has blessed her with tremendously. Lives in Mackey's Hill, Kingston. And she had and demonstrated a strong love and passion for children over the years to make her home available for a very, very long time. She started doing so in the, in, in, in the year, according to our records, officially as a foster parent in 20. 2002 and did so throughout um, the period right up through December of 2017. Even as she was advancing age, Miss Mona Bramble never said no to us. Even sometimes it was challenging and difficult. She always said, Miss John, 
I go try and I love children and she have always amid her limitation would go the extra mind make the extra sacrifice to open her heart open her home to a child who was vulnerable and in need of help so this morning it gives us a tremendous joy to recognize the contribution made by Miss Mona Bramble towards the life of the children whom she would have um, fostered over the years and I know that their lives have been enriched because of the contribution that she has made and Miss Bramble on behalf of the ministry we really want to say thank you for the work that you have done the sacrifices you have made in the lives of these children so this morning it gives us pleasure to give you this little award and to appreciate the efforts that you would have made God bless you as your advantage is you are not well but we thank God for you The three-day foster parent training was organized by the Child Care Protection Division in the Ministry of National Mobilization and funded by UNICEF in collaboration with the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. For the API, I am Shanna Daniel reporting. take a break now and be back in just a moment still to come small business owners here learn more about how to access funding and we'll feature the a new program that is changing lives through skills acquisition stay with us for the details did you know that the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines implemented a ban on the importation of styrofoam products as of May 1st 2017 a message brought to you by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce. Welcome back. You're reviewing the presentation from the API. Small business owners in St. Vincent and the Grenadines got the opportunity to learn how they can access funding through the Direct Assistance Grant Scheme. This information was disclosed at a sensitization workshop on Friday, April 20th. The workshop was spearheaded by Invest SVG and the Carbon Export Development Agency. We get more details in the following report. Invest SVG, in its quest to support businesses to export and to grow, hosted a one-day sensitization workshop on the Direct Assistance Grant Scheme. The workshop was held on Friday, April 20th at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Conference Room. Deputy Executive Director of Invest SVG, Mrs. Nadine Agar Juliarat, explained that one of the challenges business owners highlighted is access to finance. Caribbean Export Development Agency is actively making a concerted effort to register a difference in this area. Caribbean Export will assist with access to financial assistance through the Direct System Assistance Grant Scheme. This facility is a reimbursable grant and as such, successful applicants will be reimbursed to a certain level for funds expended on pre-approved and agreed upon activities, but Mr. McNair and his team will give you far more details. This is an application process and Caribbean Export is here today in the person of, in the person of Mr. McNair and his team to demonstrate how to approach the application process. The DAGS is one of the initiatives put forward that is designed to enhance the region's competitiveness and export capacity while increasing trade and exports. There are indeed other areas that also require attention, and it is the responsibility of business support organizations in general to lend a hand here. Other, other hurdles we have yet to overcome in the region are information barriers, trust barriers, high energy costs, non-compliance with sanitary and phytosanitary standards, regional interconnectivity and logistics issues, and the region's lack of use of trade and development agreements. We are aware that addressing these issues will take buy-in from not only BSOs, but also from the policymakers, grant funding agencies, and the various financial institutions. From within our own backyard, we have created a program to assist in the growth 
of our own private sector. Invest SVG is pleased to partner with Caribbean Export to develop, to develop this homegrown initiative. The High Expo Program, you'll see the banner to your media left, or the High Export Potential Program. This is the brainchild of Invest SVG's staff and it seeks to assist by way of mentoring local companies that have demonstrated high levels of quality, innovation, and workmanship. This assistance will take place over a two-year period, and then the process will start again. Director of Trade in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce, Ms. Okolo Patrick, said the Direct Assistance Grant Scheme is funded by the European Union under the 11th EDF Private Sector Development Programme. We are anticipating that under the 11th EDF, the grant contracts will increase and more Vincentian businesses will be able to benefit from the grant scheme. And this will result in an increase in our export, both regionally and internationally. Additionally, we look forward to the initiatives which will allow the business support organization to play a more substantial role in expanding the program and we welcome eff the efforts from Caribbean Export to train grant advisors within the business support organization. We recognize that the access to finance is a critical pillar to enable businesses to expand, create new jobs and generate foreign exchange earnings. And so we appreciate this important assistance to the private sector. Now applying for the grant, there are some criteria that we must meet, but I don't think that we should have any difficulties, just to name a few. You just have to be a legal um, company registered within the um, Cari Forum states. Investment services and aftercare facilitator of Invest SVG and one of the country advisors on the direct assistance grant scheme, Ms. Anginella Young, gave an overview of the scheme. Applicants will be judged on the feasibility of the project as well as their ability to complete the project as indicated in their proposal. So do not put that you're going to move the mountain and then when you get the money, the mountain remains the same place. You have to move it in order for you to be reimbursed. Applications receiving a final score of 70% or greater will be considered for the grant. So there is a scoring process in the when, when you're being evaluated. And uh, the, once you ha get 70% and over, you will be considered for the grant. The more you get, the better your chances are of getting the grant, okay? Um, of course, this whole evaluation process, um, Mr. McNair will go over in detail so that you can know how the point systems go and what you need to do and what you shouldn't do, okay? Eligible project cost, equipment and upgrade, equipment upgrade and modernization, okay? so. Well, the list I'm about to give you is, um, it is a list for guidance only, and it's not exhaustive, okay? The, the final list will be on the site for Caribbean Export, where you will get all the details, as I indicated before. So, equipment upgrade and modernization, this is an el eligible cost. Retrofitting facilities to attain a specific standards, all right? International food quality environment, all these are uh, um, eligible costs. So you can apply if you're in a business, food business, and you want to bring your business up to standard. Research and development and innovation, training programs, technical assistance, marketing services and activities. For example, trade fairs, participation, trade mission in marketing activities. Manager Competitiveness and Export Promotions of the Caribbean Export Development Agency, Mr. Christopher McNair, took time in his presentation to answer questions from participants. New project, new agreement with Caribbean Export. Anything you, you have done before the date you sign a contract with us is irrelevant to this project. So you can't... You know, I think one of the points that were, were raised this morning is that we don't recognize anything that's being spent retrospectively. Um, so it's 
if you sign a contract with us January 1st, program starts January 2nd, everything that is going to be recognized by us and everything that's going to be used to support your reimbursement must be dated after that. Yeah? Okay. We have situations, just can touch, go back to the, the old financing element. We do have situations where persons go in and borrow money or get an indication from their financial institution that they're willing to fund the project if awarded a grant, and that's perfectly fine. Bear in mind, whatever loan agreement or credit agreement you come, you have with your financial institution, the interest is between you and them. So if you take a, a loan for, the program is six months, implementation timeline is six months. If you take a loan for six months, whatever interest charge that's gonna, you're gonna incur, that's on you. Bear in mind also that we reimbursed you 70%. So there's a 30% there that you're gonna have to figure out because you have to demonstrate to us that you have financing for 100%. Yeah? Have you all had discussions with any banks regionally about this program? Great question. And I was gonna get to that actually. So under the 10th EDF, we actually tried to work with the commercial banks to see, well, work with all the financial institutions in the region to see if we can work, work something out. Um, we didn't get, we didn't have any success at all with the commercial banks. The commercial banks were not interested. The credit unions were not interested. The only institutions that had any interest were the development banks. The development banks and those countries that have eggs in banks. And, and you could understand why, because they tend to have, have a, a development agenda because they tend to be government owned and structured. The Deputy Executive Director of Invest SVG used the Direct Assistance Grant Scheme Sensitization Workshop to introduce three small businesses who will be mentored by Invest SVG over the next two years. They were chosen via um, our partnership with Caribbean Exports. Uh, there's a, a, a device, a tool that they utilize to narrow down everybody based on the information submitted by the candidates. And they are our output. So next time it opens in two years, we really recommend that you all push and sign up. We had it on all our media and everything. We had it in the newspaper. <laughs> Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I am Keisha Woodley. You're viewing the presentation from the API. We will be back in just a moment with a look at the a new program. Stay with us. A lot goes into shaping an individual, but it all starts here. What may seem to us like simple fun is critical to their education and overall development. It's how they start to define and understand the speech, how they develop their motor skills and hand-eye coordination. Remember, children are never too young to learn. This message was brought to you by the UNICEF Office for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, the Caribbean Child Support Initiative, and this station. Welcome back. It is a program that is changing lives through skills acquisition. It is called Another Nexus in Education for the Workforce Development or ANEW. It focuses on giving a second chance to young people and adults. Nadia Slater has more in the following report. I, I spent about, let's say, six years procrastinating. I'm going back to school this year. I'm trying to do this this year. And, and then I finally got up one morning and said, you know what? Time to stop putting it off. I have to do this because I need this done in the next five years. I, I, I don't know if this program will still be available. I don't know if I'd still have this opportunity. So I'm taking it now that I have it. I'm, I'm not regretting any moment of it. Meet Dehele Batiste. She's a young mother of three children. She's a budding chef who hopes to get into the teaching profession one day. But her first love is the culinary arts. Her dreams were given a rebirth with the Anu project another nexus in education for workforce development. I have always wanted to further my studies. I kind of didn't get to graduate high school in a sense because I had a baby around the same time that I did CXDs and so on. But within myself, I always knew that I wanted to further my education. 
So I had a cousin that started the program in 2015, I believe. And after everything that she said to me about the program, I knew it was something that I had to get into because they offered the exact program that I wanted to get into, which was commercial food preparation. So that's how I came about to get to know that the program was available and getting enrolled in it myself. She became enrolled at the Camden Park Technical Institute in a course which offers a Caribbean vocational qualification in commercial food preparation. The people see you and they figure because you're a grown woman, you're not supposed to go back to school, you're not supposed to try and for yourself. I mean, I have children to look up to me. How am I supposed to look at them in the next five years and feel comfortable knowing that they, they, they might bypass me education-wise? You know, so I have to keep up my standards in order for me to be able to teach them something different. So that was, that was it for me. Dahele is among 46 other students enrolled at the Camden Park Technical Institute, pursuing CVQs in a number of subject areas, including welding, data operations, electrical installation, food and beverage services. David Penniston is a principal at the Camden Park Technical Institute. He says their new program has given technical vocational education and training a boost. It's what we refer to as catering for at-risk students, mainly students who are out of school, giving them a second chance, students who would have maybe dropped out, those who were thrown out from secondary schools, superannuated, those who maybe became pregnant, so we're giving them a second chance to come back into school, especially those who are financially disadvantaged, where they don't have that kind of financial support, they weren't working. Ken Rikertels is the director of the Sector Skills Development Agency, under which the new program falls. Well, as part of the overall TVET strategy, to, to help in alleviating poverty among the youths and of course some adults and mainly um, household persons in charge of household and so on because it was realized that a high percentage of these persons did not make it further than primary school and therefore they, they were very vulnerable so and there was a level of poverty that existed among such persons so in order to increase their chances of employability and to help read a reduction in poverty among these persons, the annual program came in so as to make it better for these people and less vulnerable. The new program is funded by a grant from the Caribbean Development Bank and aims to reach 1,000 individuals. So far, over 600 persons have benefited under the program at the four technical institutes in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in Camden Park, Kingston, Georgetown and Barrowley. So the program helps to, well, to pay assessors, of course, to assess these um, persons in their training, provision for materials and equipment. Um, and the trainees themselves, where children are in, in, involved, and there are some day, daycare center, the, the, the project makes allowance to, to give them stipend and to pay these daycare center for the youth, their children that attend those institutions. They also give, or the project also give um, PPEs, you know, protective personal equipment for their training. So persons who are not able to buy their helmets, yeah, persons who are not able to buy a helmet, mm -hmm. yes, uh, their, their gloves, overalls, and so forth, the project makes provision for that. So the students, when they come here, right, a new program will reimburse the transportation on a monthly basis, and for those students who have students or who have children in preschool or in daycare, right, the a new program will pay for those for those students as well. You might think to yourself, okay, it's hard for me to go back to school because I have a child who's going to preschool, I have a child who's going to primary school, I, I'm not walking and I might not have a partner who's walking to support me through it. But with the program that I'm in, the annual program, they offer us an opportunity to do better for ourselves per se. It's like we're getting paid to go back to school. They pay the child's preschool fee for the time that you're in school they give you your passage money to and from school so it, it 
lifts a little bit of a, the burden off you as a parent because you know I mean it's not easy to come up with $150 $200 at the end of the month to pay school if you plus going to school it's not easy so for that I want to say thank you to the ANU um, coordinators for, for that little support because it really has come a long way for us and it really helps us out so that's one thing I would say you can do that because you know you have that support the program has given a boost to the TVET sector helping it to gain resonance with the youth as well as showing its importance in national development. Because everything around us is linked and depends on tech work, right? So everything that we do. And you see with the technical vocational education, students can gain employment easily, right? They can become entrepreneurs, they can become self-employed, do their own work, right? So that's one of the reasons why it is so much in demand. But have you noticed that everything is becoming technology driven these days? So persons are looking for persons who are skilled, right? So we need a lot of skilled workers around too. We have lots of buildings going on, the tourism industry is booming in most places. So we need those persons who will be able to provide these kind of services that are required at a particular standard. You see, and the main reason I think it's in demand, the technical vocation education, is that most places, right, in the tourism industry, in the building industry, business, they're looking for persons who are certified not just a person who come and say that I can run some blocks or a person who can say I can well. They want to see that you can perform what you say you can perform. So they want to see the certificate. So that is why we have the CVQ Level 1 certificate proving a person competent. So when you take that certificate anywhere, it is showing or saying to the employer that I am competent to perform these particular skills at this particular level. And it is very highly recognized. The Caribbean Vocational Qualification, awarded to trainees at the end of a successful program, gives them the opportunity to pursue careers throughout the Caribbean and even continue their program. Because the whole issue is that we are delivering CBQs which are recognized regionally. So if you have your CBQ certificates, and, and as from the annual, they would get a level one certificate, where they do not complete fully and they get unit awards, then they can go to another country and complete the other additional units and get their full qualification. Because whatever they do is recognized regionally. So that's the certificate that we are delivering and that's the one that the program, the annual program is catering for also. Yeah, the, the students, they work with a standard that we use from Cantor. And this standard is made up of 12 units, so the students get to do basic cookery. They're being trained to really work on their own, once given instruction to work on their own. So they get to do things like um, bread making, cake making, they get to do um, preparing cooked vegetables, um, different ways, they get to do soups, they get to do meat, poultry, fish and so on. They also get to do the soft skills like um, teamwork, um, communicating with others. They get to learn how to do proper hygiene and cleaning and to adhere to safety also. So with the Caribbean Vocational Qualifications, a student who gains that certificate can go anywhere around in the Caribbean and gain employment. He can just apply to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here and get the CSME, Skills Worker Certificate and apply to any Caribbean country and work without a work permit. And the programs are usually one year each. It's good to want to develop yourself. Nothing is wrong with feeling like you can get up in the morning and then you can say, okay, look, I'm going back to school today because in the next year or so, I'm going to have a certificate to say that I'm certified at doing something. And in this world that we live in today, certificate goes a long way. We can't just say, oh, I have 10 years experience. That's not good enough now. You have to have something to show that I have the skill, I'm certified in the skill, I have it here on paper, it's written there, and I feel like, okay, you can go and you can apply to any job because you know you have that. You have that confidence on that piece of paper to say, yes, I did this, and this is good for me. And the persons that are hiring would say, she's skilled in this area. And right now, skilled workers are actually making it more than persons who go to school and get a, a degree in finances or, and so on. So it's good to have that. You know, that little piece of paper to give you that extra confidence, that extra boost, because right now, I'm so looking forward to graduation. 
for Dahalia, the road has not been easy, managing school full-time and a family. Getting up in the morning, it's like a 5.30 morning. You get up, you have the two babies to get ready. Sometimes I didn't even iron the next day for, the, for, for today. So it, 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 what should I say? It's very demanding. It, it takes a lot of time. And plus, I have to take two vans to get from, because I live in Mahou. So I have to get from Mahou to Clare Valley to bring the babies to school and then back from Clare Valley to Camden Park to get to school. And I have to get to school for 8.30. Yeah? So it, 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 it's always challenging. And plus, I have a one year old who never, ever does anything I say. Because I said, Nicholas, come put on the pants. And Nicholas gone along the road. <laughs> Nicholas gone back the road. So I have to be running behind him. So it's always, it's always a challenge because you never know what to expect from him. One time he's good, another time he's bad. So it, it, it keeps me going. It keeps me young. <laughs> so, so. With another month or so to graduation, she's encouraging other young people to follow the path to development and raising the bar. You have to want something bad enough to say sacrifice the time and sacrifice your efforts because if you don't want it, if, if it's not important enough to you, you will not understand or you will not appreciate the sacrifices that you make. Their new project, giving people a second chance in pursuing careers and more importantly, building the way to a brighter future. You're viewing the presentation from the API. Before we leave, we invite you now to take a look at our notice board for important notices and announcements. The Forestry Services is pleased to inform the general public that there weren't any reported instances of river poisoning during the 2018 Easter season. That being said, a gentle reminder that poisoning of rivers and streams is a dangerous practice which is detrimental to your health and can cause complications. It is also illegal with penalties of up to $2,000 and 6 months imprisonment. Warra Warra River Works, Paulia Community Meeting the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines intends to conduct river embankment protection works in the Warawara River, Annasville, in the area known as Pole Yard. As a result, residents in the area are invited to a community meeting on Wednesday, April 25, 2018 at Bumper's Garage, where officials will explain how the works will benefit the community. The meeting starts at 4.45 p.m. and will be hosted by NEMO and the Ministries of Economic Planning and Transport and Works. For more information, please contact the Ministry of Economic Planning at 457-1746 or Bumper and Ian. And that is how we end this evening's presentation from the Agency for Public Information. Thank you very much for viewing. I trust that you found it to be quite informative. You can join us again on Thursday DV at 8 p.m. when we will be back with another presentation. Remember, you can also check out our YouTube channel or connect with us on Facebook to stay informed on the plans and projects of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Until next time, I am Shana Daniel. Good night and God bless.